Okay, is everybody here or being admitted? Hello, <clears throat> I'm Karina Burston. I'm here from the Society of Arts and Crafts and we are very excited to have a special conversation tonight. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple introductory remarks. Um, we are really thankful to all of our sponsors, Fidelity, Boston Cultural Cons Council, Kim Investment Group, Mass Cultural Council, and a host of fabulous um, fiber organizations that you can see on your screen. And I just want to thank everybody for coming and participating in this. We're looking forward to a wonderful conversation tonight. And with that, I'm going to introduce Lois Russell, who is our board member, who is going to be having this conversation with Corey Alston, who is a wonderful sweetgrass basket maker. And Lois, who is also a basket maker of, of a fine one, frankly, um, will have wonderful things to talk to him about. So with that, I'm going to take myself out of the picture and take it away, Lois and Corey. How you doing, Ms. Lois? You're on mute, Lois. That happens to me all the time. So now I have to say hello again, but there can never be too many hellos. Hello, Corey. Um, one of the, the enjoyable parts about this project has been that I've gotten to talk to Corey a couple of times to, um, to prepare ourselves. I've just done a quick skim of our participant list and hello to all of you that I know well. There's lots of basket makers in this list, Corey. So we're, I'm hoping we'll get some, some tough questions about exactly how you, you make this. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're having this conversation because I, I really value the baskets that Corey and the others in his part of the country make. Uh, we often hear that uh, craft is getting homogenized in America, but this is a place and a practice that has remained um, true to its heritage and it's guarded carefully by people. So um, it's, it's very, very special. I think there are three general areas I wanna get into. Corey's going to fill us in on the background of Gullah culture and Gullah basket making. And then we're gonna learn about Corey himself. And then for all of us basket wonks, we are going to um, hear all about the gathering and of materials and the making and the techniques. So Corey, would you like to fill us in on what Gullah means, particularly in terms of basket making? So basket weaving and, and the Gullah culture would go hand in hand um, for the simple fact that uh, the culture was brought into the coast of Carolina because of the skill of what the Africans was able to do as they were enslaved and brought into America. They were uh, mostly required to grow, cultivate, harvest, clean and dry raw rice. And so as the rice was, was the number one staple of that time of enslavement, the enslaved had the skill of rice cultivating, growing the rice, and then also cleaning the rice. So it brought the sweetgrass basket art form involved during that time is because the rice fanning basket, the flatter style basket was used for separating the rice from the shaft. And so as it was used for a, a winnowing style, um, thrashing style basket, that winnower was used to separate the rice from the shaft. And so it was so much so needed um, because that was a, a cleaning tool. Um, and so as the art form was kept alive, it was then passed from parent to child generationally. Okay. Do, you, do you need another slide? Um, well, I didn't even start on the slides yet. Oh, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we, can definitely, uh, we can definitely get started on that whenever someone is ready. This is just an introduction of who I am, slide yeah. one. 
um, you know, for those that do want to reach out to me or follow any of my work or, or email me, text me or call me, that's my information on the bottom. Facebook is probably my most busiest uh, form of social media. And so that is my information there on a Facebook link. And yes, we can do another slide. This is about you, Corey. And I'm, I know you had, you gave me two different slide production so i'm i'm this is the one that i have up on my screen this this is great this one is okay. great we Who had are all those beautiful mess. women in your life yes i'm gonna tell you all about it we had a little message just now about a patchy voice um there's difficulty technical difficulty i'm getting patchy voices so is that someone on my end or your end miss lois i'm hearing you just fine corey okay you hear me well okay yes so, so long as you hear me well. Okay, so this is my family. So I'm married. Um, my wife, Karen, is on, is on the picture on the two outsides. Um, and then I have two daughters, Karen and I, we have two daughters, Yasmin and Corinne. Um, and so they are, you know, our pride and joy. We've, we've had the opportunity of being great parents for them and raising them. And now they're 14 and 19. I have a college student and a ninth grader. Um, Karen and I, we actually met as teenagers. Um, and so um, with us meeting as teenagers, young, younger people, we actually always say that we pretty much our whole adult life, we grew up together as, as children into adults. And uh, because we were in, in our teens as we were dating, got married in our early 20s. I was 20 and Karen was uh, 19 at the time. And so uh, still together, still married. Now we are on uh, year uh, 19 of marriage. And so a lot of um, my success, I, I lean towards my spouse because she keeps me focused. She keeps me, me grounded. And so- uh, No, no Corey, I'm gonna, I'm going to interrupt you because you told me a uh -huh. very interesting story about this woman. Yes. Um, uh, that she's played a rather large part in your becoming a basket maker. And okay, she, she played more than just a large part. Um, she, um, the bloodline of basket weaving is from Karen. I'm a basket weaver because I learned it from her, her mom and her grandmother. Her grandmother is actually the famous basket weaver, Mary Jane Manigault. And as Miss Mary Jane Manigault worked work was placed into the Smithsonian, uh, she also received tons of awards uh, and accolades based on her being one of, the, one of the artisans of the Mount Pleasant area that has kept it alive. As I was a child of the community, uh, generationally, um, I met Karen in school, but when I grew up, I, I wasn't, I, my family wasn't basket weavers. My family did not, uh, they, they were not, that wasn't their skill set as they were enslaved. And so the whole, the whole learning of me doing this art form is pretty much me learning from Karen when we were dating. So around 17 and 18, you know, we had our first apartment. And so Karen pretty much showed me how to do the basics when we were kids, you know, we were teenagers. Um, and, 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 and it wasn't just her showing me, it was also the senior artisan, her grandmother, uh, also given the okay to allow me to be a weaver. Um, this craft, this heritage, this art form is a strong protected art form, um, usually just kept alive within the bloodline. Uh, but since my bloodline was from Mount Pleasant generationally, uh, she knew me, her grandmother knew me since I was a little boy. She knew my father and his father. And so it made it kind of, easier to accept me in as a young weaver because the Gullah culture was a part of my bloodline anyway. It's just that I wasn't born a weaver. My dad wasn't a weaver. My mom was not basket weavers. And so um, it was a kind of a, a okay, uh, an allowance of uh, letting me in. So yes, Karen played a major part of me being a weaver. Um, and, and so I always make sure I give credit to that no matter who I'm talking to or what, what, you know, what, where the interview may be coming from, I always want to make sure I, I realize or I tell people, 
you know, I do realize where I got it from and, and I show tons of respect to that, to that family for that. Yes, next slide. We got another slide, right? Yep, this is a map here. Yes, yes, and so part of the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor, it stretches of four states. Um, so one of the things that I wanted this slide here to show is to give the visual for everyone that may not be 100% sure of where the Gullah Geechee Corridor is, why does it exist, you know, where, 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 where is the landmass, dividing points. And so one of the best ways you can visualize here is from from uh, Jacksonville, Florida, as far north as Wilmington or Jacksonville, North Carolina, is where the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor stretches. Within that Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor, those traditions and techniques has been kept alive the longest within these four states. This here would also be known as the major hub of enslaved Africans. More enslaved Africans came in with, through these four states than any other places um, collectively, this was so, sort of the center of the, uh, of the enslavement, slave trade, uh, as it came in Charleston being pretty much right in the middle uh, city of all of this. Charleston's one of the largest cities of America to enslave and sell Africans. And so then they dispersed north and south of uh, those areas. And so the, the corridor was actually named it uh, right around 2006, the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor. Um, I live in Mount Pleasant, born and raised in Mount Pleasant. Um, and, and, and so we have that area of Mount Pleasant is right on the outskirts of, north of Mount Pleasant, a little north of Mount Pleasant, a little south of Georgetown. But that's also the same community that all the sweetgrass basket weavers are known to be from. And so it's not that sweetgrass baskets weren't done in other areas. It's not that they didn't grow rice in other areas. It's just that area of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, Highway 17 North is, is credited for one of the areas that's kept it alive the longest. And so that's this map here. Any, any questions, Ms. Lewis? Um, I don't have any questions. I'll look in the chat quickly. Um, okay, not yet. I will. That was good. That was good. I'll, I'll check it again in a minute. Yes, yes. All right, next slide. So now we have some rice up here. Yes, and so this here slide, this slide actually shows you what makes the culture such a rich culture. What was it, what was done and kept alive of that time of enslavement? And so at that time, it was properly known as Carolina gold. The Carolina gold was actually considered more of a uh, number one staple as those rices were used, harvested and grown, um, kept alive uh, uh, as a form of cash cropping. So as the Carolina gold was used for cash cropping, you use that rice for trading and bartering. As you did that, the rices were, uh, were, were grown by the Africans, stored by the Africans, cleaned and sift, bagged, and then shipped out. So as that was a trading substance, you use that rice for different staples that, you, that, the, that the people of the, the coast of Carolina were growing. So then they use that for trading. Uh, the word Carolina gold comes from more than one reason. It comes from the texture, the golden color, and then it also comes from the, the name gold comes from as it was used as a form of currency. And so the Carolina gold was a number one way of trading. If you had rice, you had money. My, that was the form, um, that rice was the form of currency. Um, so as you know, the coast to be the Carolina gold, we're actually called the low country because we have more wetlands. And so for those that know anything about cultivating uh, any rices, those were known, known to be harvested in, in freshwater ponds. And so with that being kept alive in freshwater ponds, uh, that's, that was more of the wetlands of the area. And as Charleston grew, it more took in more land mass. And so due to storms and, and different things uh, made our wetlands 
our freshwater ponds, no longer freshwater ponds, that it turned into more saltwater ponds with erosion and in the growth of the area. And so as it changed the land mass, you also change what we once had as very popular and plentiful uh, freshwater ponds. Yes. And so that's, that's what the Carolina gold is all about. Today, we eat rice. It's been bleached. You see that in one of the other pictures. And so our raw rice, the healthy way of eating it, is going to be just more of a brownish color, raw brown rice. Uh, one thing to speak more about the, 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 the rice fanning basket that I spoke about is the rice that's grown would have then used the shaft. Uh, the shaft would have been broken. You're going to see it in the slide in a little bit. But this basket process of cleaning rice from shaft was a thrashing process, um, more of a way of uh, winnowing, if, if you will. Uh, um, I always like to say that every ethnic culture has had a winnowing style uh, basket of some sort, cleaning seed, uh, bean pods, coffee, uh, panning for gold, um, uh, you name it. You know, every ethnic culture has used some form of winnowing style basket. Yes, next slide. Yeah, let's see the next one. All right, okay, and uh, here we get, we now have a slide showing some photographs of people winnowing. Wow, that's interesting. Yes, and so that's the, that's the process. That's the growing yep. of it, what it looks like on, on, on the stalk. And then also it shows the, uh, the dried product once it's already dried. And so there's, there's the whole rice cultivating era was used with the trading and bartering once again. And so did a lot of trading with the Barbados and, and the Caribbeans and, and different, different uh, uh, Caribbean islands. And then as they did they trading, then they traded more up towards New York area, sending uh, more of a, a sugar cane up that way. And then as they used the sugar cane, they traded back down south uh, to the Charleston, Georgetown area with their different goods that they would have had. It was just a big circle of trading, trading and bartering. That was that old way of fueling. Right here, the very far left picture is a gentleman actually throwing the rice in the air and he is fanning or winnowing the, the rice. Um, and you also see the, the center top picture, those ladies and, and people in that picture are beating the rice. So you use a burnt out wooden pestle. As you use that burnt out wooden pestle, you put so many pounds of rice into that burnt out wooden pestle. And as you beat the rice, you're getting the first breaks on it, the first cracks. As you got the first break or the first crack, then you take it and put it in this winnowing basket that you see here in the picture where the gentleman has uh, with a white shirt and the basket going in the air, the rice going in the air. So that's what he's doing. So as that wind would blow, the shaft would blow away and then the rice grains would, was heavier. So that stayed within the basket. And so this here, one shot, this one slide here was one of the major staples of uh, that time of enslavement of, of cash cropping. This is the whole practice in this one shot. Yes, next slide. Ooh. <laughs> All right, now we've got some beautiful baskets showing. Yeah, so I always like to look at, um, it fascinates me to know how uh, we have taken such a, a, a staple, such a, a major tool of that time of enslavement, and we've gotten more modern with it. We've gotten more artsy with it. We've gotten, uh, and so I always like to say sweetgrass, you know, the art form from past to present is something that it has evolved from not just a working tool, but now it's a work of art. Um, in my whole career, I've been more known for the fancier pieces or the more elaborate pieces. Um, and that's just something that an artisan would grow on, on his or her own, no matter what skill set they have, they could choose to, to stay traditional or, or he or she can become more of the artisan of, them, of themselves and get this a little more decorative. And so myself, specifically of my career, I, I've actually and I, uh, enjoy the the skill set of pushing myself to the limit of, of new styles, new shapes, 
something it may have never seen. Um, I'm using the same materials. I don't supplement it. I don't use anything to help uh, mold it or keep it still or shape it. Um, I'm using the exact same four grasses that you know the ancestors used uh, before before my generation and a generation before that. Um, so with that being said, we use four materials. And so with the color pattern, you can look here in this picture here. Um, uh, you uh, one well that picture there works as well. Um, that slide works as well. And so you can see how the darker brown is in that that bunch of material there. That darker brown is bulrush right there, yes. Mm -hmm. That's the biblical grass where, the, uh, where, where Moses was found in, that's bulrush. You may have heard the biblical Bible story of, of baby Moses. The lighter grass, that's the main material. That's the grass that is harvested at low tide right here in the coast of Carolina. But not being said, you can harvest other places as well. It's not the material that makes it so unique, it's the people, it's the skill set that makes it unique because I can find sweet grass and bulrush down in the Florida Everglades. I can find it around the uh, Alabama, Mississippi coastline. So what you need, you need uh, warm water and, and you need warm climate and salt water. And that's how you can find the material. Another grass that we use um, is gonna be pine needle. If you look into the center of this basket, that lighter grass, um, you see the red, and then the lighter grass around that, that red material is the longleaf pine needle. And so we do harvest that from the forest floor. Um, and so this slide here is actually showing you the different things on traditional pieces and contemporary pieces. And so in traditional times, the, the bread basket would have been more of a plain edge piece, something not fancy at all, just used for utilitarian purposes. And then now we do a lot of braids, we do a lot of funny handles, and that's just what us want, you know, what we do today as artisans. And so uh, a, in a traditional um, rice fanning basket would be something within the, the measurements of 18 to 22 inches. That's going to be a standard piece that one person can clean rice with, with a plain edge. And then more of a more of a contemporary design would be something 30 inches or larger. And so what makes it traditional is the function of it. As far as you using it for rice cleaning, if it's any bigger than about 22 inches, it's hard for a person to mm -hmm. be able to hold that and uh, have three or four pounds of rice in it and throw the rice in the air. So 22 inch would be about, about a standard. As far as materials, palmetto leaves, the state tree of South Carolina would not have been uh, one of the number one uh, materials of that time, it would have been more of a split oak. And so that split oak would have been very similar to some of the other basket weavers here in the Zoom. Y'all may have used different uh, split oaks or, or different materials that you would soak in the water once you trim it to make it pliable and flexible. And so that's what was done in earlier days as far as making a gullah basket. Now today we use palmetto leaves. And so that palmetto, it just, you know, so it's flexible. It's easier to work with, it's plentiful, it's easy to harvest. And so if you can see what I got going on here, let's see if y'all can see me. I'm gonna come a little closer to you. So this is the sweet grass, this lighter coloring. That's the bull rush, the darker brown. And speaking of the palmetto, that's this right here. That's the state tree of South Carolina. I split it down into little threads. And that's what would I would take to uh, hold it together. And so um, there's a lot of contemporary parts, a lot of more modern parts of this art form, but there's also a ton of old fashioned things that's being kept alive as well. Myself, personally, I weave for about 12 to 13 hours every day. Um, and the reason why is because of time. They're very time consuming. Um, this is a very, uh, just like every, any other art, any other baskets you may make as low as your, your pieces would take a while as well. And that's one of the things that we so much love about, you know, baskets is, is handmade. You know, you can see a, every artist would have a piece of them in the basket. That's so yeah. true. And the most, the question you get most often at booth shows is how long did it take you to make that, right? Yeah. Yes, um, we yes. have a couple of questions if I can, I think they fit in nicely here. 
One is just to clarify for people, this is coiling that you're doing, right? Correct. And we'll talk more about that technique um, in a minute or so. The question I wanted to ask right now is, is I heard years, several years ago that people were having a hard time finding these materials. Um, they were growing in state parks where people were not being allowed to collect, land was being developed, and there was real concern that basket makers would not be able to get the materials they needed. How is that working out? Well, I must say that it's still um, difficult. I would say that it's even more difficult now. Um, Charleston is one of the fastest growing cities in South Carolina. And so as you keep on, you know, uh, growth is great. You know, it's great to grow and have, you know, new communities or whatnot. But as you do that, that waterfront property that we would have harvested from now becomes protected land. Yeah. Now that protected land does not allow, you know, artisans just to go on the property and harvest. I would say the sweetgrass uh, uh, culture, we're having even harder and harder time with material now that it kind of makes it, it kind of makes it um, non-desirable to be a weaver. You know, if you can't find material, you have the devil to find it. And then if you do find it, you're going to find someone that wants to sell it to you. And then if they sell it to you, they such a price gouging that it makes it almost not worth the time to buy the material, make the basket, and then try to sell the basket. Mm -hmm. um, and so within the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years, I've noticed less and less weavers. Um, and it's because of the discouraging part of uh, harvesting material, gathering material, then drying it, then making the basket, or buying the material from an, a cousin, a nephew, uh, uh, someone that's a material handler or what have you. Um, and so with that being said, it, we're known to be a dying art form, and it's not going to get any better until we figure out how to help grow the material, protect the land, let only weavers use the material. And so that's an ongoing process. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people involved in trying to help figure that out. Um, once we do get it figured out, we have to, we have to you know, hold it close, you know, just like we've held the skill of basket weaving close. You know, not a whole lot of people know how to do it. We have to do the same with those areas of harvesting. Once we're able to get the properties um, and start harvesting in those locations, we need to start holding that close as well. Um, and focusing on the people here, uh, the people of the low country, as far as keeping the art alive. Um, I've heard some different talks of helping other people get material. We are having a hard enough time ourselves. So we don't want to, we don't well, want to talk. You're not the, <clears throat> you're not the only basket makers in the country who are finding that climate change and development, um, are making their materials harder and harder to get. I'm, I'm glad to hear there's some people working on it there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you wanna keep going with your slides? I'm, and I, I, I have a couple more questions, but I won't interrupt you for a few minutes. Okay. Um, sure, how about, how, about, how about the question? That, just, that way I can, because- Oh, okay, I, well, one of the- I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm done, you know? <laughs> no, no, you're not done. I told you we, we'd keep you talking for all night. Um, so when someone goes, I've been to the area specifically to see the baskets and there's the famous, is it Route 17? Yes. Yes. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how Route 17 developed um, and one of our what, uh, participants has sent in the question of saying that she went there and none of the stalls were set up. And is this because of the pandemic? Okay, that's a great question. Great question. So pre-pandemic, the stands were still empty. Um, the stands have been more and more empty within the years um, due to the, the difficulty of the artisans being able to bring their work to the stands and people shopping. Mm -hmm. um, Mount Pleasant, once again, is one of those growing areas. 
And as it grows, they have to also help grow the, the, the highways of the area for people to commute. So as Highway 17 has widened over the, over the different decades uh, in, in becoming more wider of a highway, even less of a, uh, a shoulder, if you will, that makes it very difficult for those basket uh, artisans to, to sell their wares. There's a lot of times when there were people on the stands, people are getting hit in the back, the cars are being hit in the back because instead of pulling off slowly, they're making an abrupt, you know, 90 degree turn into a basket stand. Um, that has happened numerous amount of times. Um, and so with, with growth, we can't stop growth of a town, um, but it also hinders those stands from being operated. Right. Um, I've noticed more stands um, have been, have been not workable. Yeah. Uh, that's a major part of it as well. Um, I don't know if anyone on this Zoom call has followed any of my pages, but um, I'm actually personally a part of an organization of Mount Pleasant called Cultural Arts and Pride Commission. And so with this, this wonderful group of Mount Pleasant, uh, we're, we're commissioners of the group, and we're able to take on different um, jobs of the community to help better our town. So I was appointed. I was appointed to the to the group as a uh, Corey Austin, a non-incorporated member of Mount Pleasant. Um, so I took on the appointment. Uh, of, I took on the, the job of being a member uh, on this uh, on this on this commission. And so every commissioner on on this on this task force, this Cultural Arts and Pride, he or she pretty much has a baby that they want to watch develop. Um, or, 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 or get done, or they have some kind of focus that they really love. Um, about meeting two or three, about meeting two or three, I speak up, you know, and I found out that the whole Cultural Arts and Pride Commission changed their bylaws to allow me to be a member because I'm in non-incorporated Mount Pleasant. I'm not in the town of Mount Pleasant. So well, that being said, the town of Mount Pleasant has funding through tourism that helps fund things that the town would like to work on. So with me being not a town of Mount Pleasant member, I live in the, in the, in the rural part of Mount Pleasant or the non-incorporated parts of Mount Pleasant, uh, tearing a Band-Aid off. I live in the black part of Mount Pleasant, um, the real areas that made the town, and that's the clear cut way to word it. So the black communities are not really in the areas of town, if that makes any sense. And I'm sure it does to yeah. a lot of you. Uh, and so my, my, my urban community of Mount Pleasant, there never was a council member on the team because he or she lived in an area that the bylaws not allow us to be a part of the, the organization or the commission. Long story short, the Sweetgrass Basket stands on Highway 17. It's now going under a major renovation Ooh. that will allow basket weavers to come back out. Um, that's, most of the stands have been built. Uh, I've seen a plaque around the area of um, town center. The plaque says on the ground, Sweetgrass Basket stands were built in 2007. So when the highway is wide, then also those stands were either moved, knocked down, and put back, placed back. And when they placed them back, this one plaque in town center says 2017. So it gives me the thought, wow, these stands haven't been worked on in, in over 14 years. And so when you're having just regular wood that holds them up, the wood is rotten, the wood is cracked, the, the leaves are, 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 are uh, the roofs are leaking. Um, there's so many different errors and issues to these stands that it made it that the basket weavers did not come out. So right. my mission on this cultural arts and pride commission that I'm a now a member of is renovate all the stand. So within that renovation process, my mentality uh, by using the, the taxpayer's money, that's, that's how everything else gets done in our commission is we fix the boards, fix roofing, paint the stands, bring them up to more modern standards. 
uh, we had issues with flooring, and so uh, uh, and so we 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 wanted to we wanted to figure out how to get around that problem, and so that was that was that's a that's a part of the commission that was being worked on as we speak. The first sweet grass basket stands we we started working on them mid July. Uh, we have eight of them uh, almost complete. And we have another set of four gonna be done on a town center that's right over there by uh, Barnes and Nobles for those that may recognize or know Mount Pleasant. Those four stands will be the next four that will be worked on. And what my mission, my process was is to slowly get all these stands back active. So these artisans can come back out and their grandkids can come back out and we can have businesses running and, and people working for themselves and keeping the proud heritage of basket weaving alive so this was a uh, this was this is this is my baby. My baby is getting all well, these things. Corey, I'm, I, it, you know nothing is more pleasurable than wandering around talking to the people who are making the items or have made the items that are for sale, and it, you you always build a real bond when you do that, and it's very clear because we're getting lots of messages from people who have met you. And uh, we'll make sure you get those messages and all right, all right. how much they enjoyed uh, meeting you and um, you've had an influence on their children. And so it'll be really good if you get back out there. Now, yes. I want to ask, is this Boone Hall we're looking at? Yes, this is. So all this right, now that's a tourist place you can tell people to go to, right? Yes, yes. And so Boone Hall is actually uh, one of the known plantations. Um, uh, as far as the one of the plantations that has kept this sweetgrass basket art form uh, alive, as most of the weavers have families that were enslaved here, and so um, a lot of a lot of the weavers would say, you know, as their family was enslaved in Boone Hall, they also learned how to make sweetgrass baskets at Boone Hall, and so uh, this is right off of Highway 17, and so right of, this is the center of uh, Sweetgrass Basket Makers Highway. That's the name of the highway. There's, um, there's a 15 mile stretch uh, on the corridor from four mile all the way, I know it's about a, about a 10, 10 mile stretch. It's from four mile to about 15 mile, we call that area CB Road. And so that's where the highway has been renamed under uh, the name of Sweetgrass Basket Makers Highway. This art form is the South Carolina State Handcraft. Um, this shot right here is actually a business collaboration that I created back in 2012. And so this business is what I call Gullah Woven Photos. Um, this Gullah Woven Photo business allowed me to take my woven image, find low country backgrounds, and I'm able to sell um, my sweetgrass baskets in, in the form of a photo. And so it's a great way of showing the art and then also showing the low country scenes as well. And so um, I usually only bring the sweetgrass basket photography out when I'm in major events, uh, the State Fair of South Carolina, the Coastal Fair of, of the low country. Um, uh, within the city market, as I work daily, I'm not able to do the photography there because there's different rules and stipulations that I have to abide by. And so once you're already one business and my first business was Sweetgrass, then the, then the, um, the second business that I came up with was the photography. And it's such a long list of people that wanna become businesses of the market. They wanna make sure everyone can get in. And so I'm not able to do photography in the market, but I can definitely do it in other locations. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. So this shot here, Ms. Lois, this yes. is called, um, this, this picture here is, um, Oh my goodness, I had a, a, a mind, mind blankness now. Oh, that happens. Because <laughs> I, I, I name all my, all my photos. Um, well, we can, we can just look at the next photo and you'll remember it five minutes this, after the show, this, our recording ends. This is, this is slave quarters. This is slave quarters. Uh, and the reason why I call that is because oh, okay. the, the, the uh, as I visualize the shot, when I shot it, hey, there's some other photographers that I know of the, of the area. And they have told me numerous of times, man, Corey, that shot is something else. You know, most of us photographers, we couldn't get that shot. We couldn't get it and then we couldn't sell it. 
And so my question is why, you know, and they said, well, it's kind of a painful shot, but you made it very pretty and, and very, very, uh, very colorful, right? And I said, well, the purpose that I shot this pic um, is because slave quarters of Carolina is what I call it, is because those slave quarters enslaved the Africans and made the baskets. And so as I brought the sweetgrass baskets in front of the slave quarters was a way of showing that shot to be um, putting that time of enslavement behind us and bringing more of the beautiful art form in front of us. So that's why I put the slave quarters in the back and then also the, the sweetgrass art form is in the front. And in that symbol, that, that picture there that you just seen also shows those traditional baskets of, of rice standing baskets. And but that's, that's also, what we do. It's also important, I think, to make sure that we, we see that connection between these beautiful baskets and the work that was done by those enslaved people. Correct. They're Correct. gift to us. Yes. So this slide here that we're looking at, we're looking at the, the elaborate designs that I've so enjoyed in my whole career. Um, uh, no, I'm not working with wet material. I just read that just now. I'm actually <laughs> working with dried material. And so uh, all of us basket weavers, let's see, if, let's see if I can get you to see what I got going on here. Let's see, move my camera no, think, just a little bit. I think bit. we really want to see how you make this, Corey. I've been weaving the whole time. I um, know. And so this here, this is my dry material. And yep. so there's no waters in here. And so within this dry material, we do have, I do have the bundles of all different grasses that we, uh, that we weave with. Um, we lay in the sun to sun dry for about two to three weeks, uh, mm -hmm. the sweet grass and the, and the bulrush. And we don't harvest pine needle until it already drops. Okay. Um, so, and so that's, that's already a red color. We use no synthetics. We use no machines. All the shapes and design in that slide that you just seen, all those shapes and designs are woven. And I can turn my tool. This is my tool that I weave with. Every basket weaver has a tool called the nail bone. This is the only tool that we use. Hopefully you can see it in this shot. What this does, it sticks a hole big enough for the palmetto to go through just like that. So that let's, let's make sure in case we have people who aren't familiar with coiling, what you have hanging out the end of your basket is a clump of grass. Is that right? Correct. All right. And you are securing that clump of grass to the grass you've already processed into the basket. So you're taking a row of grass, a clump of grass, and sewing it onto the part of the basket you've already made. Correct. That, that's why these, they're So there is, a, there is a very, very popular book um, that is called The Row Upon Row. Yes. That book, A Row Upon Row, is basically saying we're making one row and then we're attaching another row upon it continuously, continuously, and it slowly shapes what right. you see here in this slide. Yep. It slowly and becomes one of these masterpieces because we continue to work on that row, continue until that basket slowly starts to poke out in those areas that we wanted to poke out in. Now, how do you, tell us how you keep that clump of grass. How do you add new grass to that and keep it nice and even? So this is gonna be based on the skill set. Um, we use, um, I know about pine needle baskets very well. Um, and I know how pine needle baskets uses what we call gauging. And yeah. what that does in pine, no, I've never did pine needle baskets. So this is a thickness of the road that I'm working with. In pine needle baskets, we would use a straw and you would stuff the straw to keep the same consistency to make everything nice and even, right? Right. So in, in gullah baskets, in gullah baskets, there is no straw. There is, um, 
Can everyone see me? Yep. I don't know. That, that message just now says something about a full screen. Um, so in, in gullah baskets, we use no straw. We use no gauging. We use just, I'm going to hold this up again. We use just the free-handed hand skill, the feeling of what the row feels like as it thins out. And as it thins out, thank you, Tyrone. And as it, fill, and as it fills out, then we add more. And so that, that idea of adding material for the same consistency is part of the skill set. That's part of what we're doing. Yes. And you also have to add new um, palmetto to- Palmetto, right. Within, within, yes, with, with it, uh, palmetto would be the length of two and a half feet long, you know? Okay. Um, so you have a, so this here, this is a palm, this is my threading. Mm -hmm. Once I use this out, then I add another one. So you can see from hand to hand how long it is. So then the adding of new palm is something that happens continuously. The adding of more grass is continuously feathered in, if that makes any sense. And then the also the, um, the adding of any colors. So if we want to change it from bulrush to go to red, and that's going to be pine needle, that's going to be a slow process. As we finish using one material, then we start feeding in another material. Right. And so if you look here at this slide that's being shown, on, on the slides, you have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these eight pictures. These eight pictures in the slide has the variation of all the grasses that we use. Right. Um, and in my career, I've been challenged more than you can imagine. Um, th this challenge of Corey, make this one, Corey, do that. Um, at times, it feels like it's impossible. You know, I cannot do that. It's, I have no idea how to do that. And then the, the client, well, yes, you can. You'll figure it out. And yes, I figure it out. But they have more faith in me than I have in myself at some times. This well, little picture here, I don't know if you see that one, Ms. Lois. Yeah. Right? That, that smallest picture. Yeah. That was probably one of my toughest projects as a client. This brings me deer antlers and say, Corey, put them in a basket. And I, ah. I told them it's impossible. But I got it done. And so that was a uh, major challenge right there. The largest piece in my career is going to be the very far left. Uh, those oh, yeah. two baskets right there are the largest of my career as of today. Um, and those were shipped out to Sacramento. I worked for that client for seven months. And so that's the far left, top left picture. Um, that was a major, major job. And I've been blessed to have a permanent art display of the basket right below it. And I call that Art Expressions of 2020. And that's now in the Charleston uh, Visitor Center in a glass case. And so that's the piece that's right below the, the deer antlers to the left. Yeah. That's the- uh, uh, These that's are a beautiful. And, Thank you and so, much. so when you're, and you're getting all of these great shapes and loops by just making your new row go where you want it to go. Correct. All yes. right. Yes. So All the right. possibilities are endless, Corey. They, they, they are. They are. And what you being what you say in that, Miss Lois, is the, the, the possibilities are endless. This is a great shot that saves way into that. Not only that we do this artwork and we're making the functional pieces functional baskets that we all use, but we also can enjoy the art by wearing it. I wear the sweet grass myself. Um, I, I have hats, I have bracelets. Um, if you look real closely at that wedding band that I'm wearing in that picture there, um, that actually is a company that has taken the sweetgrass image and put it into sterling silver. So wow. I even wear a sterling silver sweet, sweetgrass band. That, that ring was made specifically for me. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, so there is a basket in the Charleston airport uh, that I did weave is in, the, is in the lounge. So if anyone has lounge access, there's a rice fanning basket in the lounge. And then the other gorgeous baskets that are in that glass case are from the very well-known Mary Jackson. And yeah. so she has beautiful work that are uh, in the airport as well. 
But this shot here, this slide here, this shows other ways of enjoying the sweetgrass art form other than a bread basket. And so, right. uh, yes, and so- uh, Well, I, I think the bread would have to be pretty fancy to go in some of your baskets, Corey. You know? Well, no, just, just some regular good old bread. Good old bread. bread. Good old so bread. These are your tools. Job. I'm gonna ask if anyone has questions for Corey, if you start putting them into the chat, I will start making sure that he, he, he told me when we were preparing for this that he could answer any question. So Ooh, that's challenge. That means, that means uh, don't try to stump me. But uh, but if you try to stump me, I'm gonna try to get through it. It's very uh, all right. I'm gonna try to get through it. So, so tell us about here. these tools. Yes, yes. So the tools, the tools are all, are so historic as well. The tools are as old as the art, of course. And so with that being said, the original tool that I held up earlier. And I showed you, and you may have seen it. I'm gonna hold it up again. The tool that I held up earlier, this is the only tool we use. I've modified it with about, I don't know, 15 rubber bands. Gives me a pushing, gives me something a little stout to hold in my hand, my hands are bigger. And so this tool goes back to the slide. The slide here, the very first tool that the enslaved use and the Africans before being enslaved was a bone of an animal, an animal bone. And as that animal bone was used, filed down and sharpened, he or she was able to make baskets that way for many, many generations mm. by using an animal bone. As time progressed and we started using more metals here in the United States, as the enslaved were brought into the low country of Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina, making the same baskets, they stopped using the bone as there were more metals being used. As those metals were being used, then they started using a flattened nail head. And so that nail head worked as the same purpose. Now you'll see us basket weavers, every one of us, every weaver you'll find uses a nail bone. And that purpose is to stick a hole in the material big enough for the palmetto to go through. But every weaver has a trusty nail bone that he or she loves, and they rather not use no other one. And so- That's right. Um, this picture in the middle, the black and white picture, that's my personal nail bone. Um, and so that's, that's the one that I've been using uh, now for about 21-ish years. Um, and that's my favorite, that's my favorite buddy. You know, it's like, uh, you, you know, you got a favorite pair of shoes, no matter how old or dirty it gets, that's still your favorite shoes. This nail bone here fits to my hand very well. And I, I hate to misplace it. I would rather misplace my cell phone or <laughs> anything that someone may find very dear to them. I'd rather misplace that than misplace my tool that I spend 10 to 12 hours with daily. Yes. And so these now, are the original tools that we use, Ms. Lois. Corey, we're getting some concern and some questions about um, are, are enough people learning how to do this that it is going to continue and be a healthy uh, cultural community for you. And also, I think you're inspiring people because people wanna know if you teach anywhere. All right, so great questions. I would say first question, as far as it being kept alive. Um, uh, Tyrone was in the chat just now. Yes. Singleton. Um, haven't met him yet, but I understand that his grandmother was a weaver or is a weaver. So the best way to answer that question by bringing in someone in the chat, how to bring them up into the conversation is the way of keeping the art alive the best is by that generational child to, 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 to lean on those ancestors, those older folks, so they can learn the art. And that's the best way to word it is the way of keeping this alive is as us uh, younger weavers or we are adults of today, we knew grandma used to do it or grandma's grandma used to do it. We need to lean on them so then we can learn that skill set. And then as we learn that skill set, then we can pass it on and then continue to keep it along within our bloodline. If that makes any sense, Ms. Lois, that's the best way to describe how it can be kept alive and the way that it's best to be kept alive. Now, are um, either weavers, of your daughters interested in doing it? So the weaver's responsibility is to teach the children. And so with that being said, answers your question, they don't have a choice. It's heritage. Oh. It's, 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 a, um, it's, a, it's the way of life. 
And so just like some people in the chat may have had a grandmother that, that had a biscuit recipe or, or, or peach cobbler recipe, she's not gonna show the neighbor how to make that peach cobbler because they became friends. She wants that recipe to stay within the bloodline. Uh, or Native Americans. We can all travel to a Native American reservation, enjoy the reservation, but we don't take the reservation with us. We leave it there, we leave it unscarred, so then we can go back again and enjoy it and go back and learn more and enjoy that. Uh, uh, it's family heritage by teaching it generationally. Yeah. Uh, this for our heritage. Our heritage has shown the, the next generation, based on the parenting, based on the grandparents, they're the ones that have shown it to the next generation. Usually grandmothers have been known to have some of the most patience for grandchildren. So a lot of grandmothers may show those grandkids the skill set. And then as he or she gets older, then they, of course, can become more artsy, more decorative, more, more fancier in the art form. But the basics is needed to be known is not necessarily showing that, that young person the art because you want him or her to keep the business alive. No, right. it's more keeping it the art in case you need to fall back on something in case we get into some kind of uh, 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 financial issue with our country and your, your job, you lost your, your job, you lost the career, you went so many years for schooling, you have a fallback business. You have a fallback skill set. Um, and so that's why I always empower my children to understand why is it so important because as I have a sophomore in college and she has a whole different career choice, she still would need to know how to, how to survive and make the hand-skilled art form that her grandparents kept alive generationally. Um, and so it's a must that we learn from our, our, our older weavers and, and that's how it's kept alive. And with that being said, the art form has dated back to over 300 plus years here right. in the coast of Carolina. Um, we worry about keeping it alive, but then we shouldn't worry. And for the simple fact is because this is only one Pacific generation. It's been kept alive generations before us. And so there's always someone that's going to be that next big uncle, that next big mama, that next auntie that shows so many, you know, there's always someone of every generation that does something awesome that keeps someone interested. Um, and so whoever he or she is, they're going to help the next generation want to keep it alive as well. Great question, though. Great question. So, Corey, you are certainly doing your part. Um, and I really appreciate that. I know everybody who's on this call does as well. Um, and we are past seven o'clock. So I am good. I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, everybody knows how to get hold of you. Um, okay. Great idea to follow you. Should I, should I finish this slide or you or may? Not? I'm sorry. No, I'm just, just curious. I hate I hate for us to go over time. But That's if okay. Have... If people don't have to stay on, but um uh I'm interested in what you have to say about this slide. Okay, so let me let me speed it up a little bit because I don't think I have many slides left. Okay. So one of the one of the one of the biggest misconceptions and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, confusement within the culture is going to be this slide. This slide is one of the biggest misconception and confusion that I would love to speak about first with the palmetto roses. The palmetto roses are something um, that's something that's been kept alive in the area for generations, just like sweetgrass basket weaving has been. But palmetto roses are not a part of Gullah culture at all. Palmetto roses has been adopted and now the basket weavers make them. Palmetto roses date back to days of Confederacy. As that Confederate soldier would have fought in the wars, he or she, uh, I'm sorry, he was given this palmetto rose to wear as a love token. He wore that as a remembrance of his mom, grandma, girlfriend, or wife. As he went to fight the Union, we know the history of Union and Confederacy. They, 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 they did not have the same mission and that's why they was fighting, of course. He would then bring that rose back to that Confederate mother, wife, grandmother, or daughter, and give it to them as a love token. Today, we make these roses. They're not sweet grass roses. They are palmetto roses that is made by a sweet grass weaver. So if, that's, if that clears it up. So you can call it a Carolina rose. You can call it a palmetto rose, or you can call it a Confederate rose. 
The true story is about giving it as a love token. The Gullah culture find that to be a very pleasant, a very pleasant sound, a very pleasant meaning, and it's a state tree of South Carolina. So what that's harvesting, what I have in my hand right here, hopefully you can see my hand, the palmetto once again, what harvesting the palmetto to make the baskets is the exact same material that we use to make the roses. And so we have taken on, adopted the rose making as a culture because it's the same material and it's a state tree and it has a very pleasant meaning. The next picture, that's a misconception or mis, mis, uh, uh, people always wonder well, what the heck is going on with the culture? How does that work or how did it happen? Will be the black and white picture. The black and white picture are some of the very first weavers ever. They were men. Men were the original weavers. Men started the art form. Men has, men has been uh, more moved into other parts of the culture and women are credited for keeping it alive in the States for over 300 plus years. So us men that are weavers now, it's very rare to find a man weaver, but we are very proud that the women has kept it alive because if it wasn't for the women within the past 300 plus years, we wouldn't have basket weaving of today of the United States basket. This here is the picture of older men showing young men how to make baskets. The reason why they were the most of the weavers is because they had strong hands. They pulled a tighter piece. A gullah basket is based on how how, how long it can last, how tight it is, the functions of using it. Uh, as that time moved forward, men more took on different job sets as, as American men, uh, uh, enslaved men took on different job sets, blacksmithing, uh, 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 um, uh, brick mason, plowing fields, fishing, so on and so forth. Women more stayed closer to the house. So they kept the basket weaving alive and then they also had to make the fanning basket for rice cultivation. So as the men were kind of done, pushed away for different other jobs, women has kept it alive, started showing their daughters and daughters, daughters moving forward on, on how to keep it alive. And so that's one of the biggest misconceptions of, of the art as far as well, how it was kept alive, who brought it, who started making it, and now who's making it now. And women are definitely credited for, uh, we, we couldn't have did it without without the ladies. We are we're definitely credited for keeping it alive generationally. That top shot, those blue bottles, goes back into traditions and 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 um, and folklore and uh, and evil spirits. You know, every culture has it. And so that bottle tree, that blue bottle tree, was known in the Gullah culture as something that would save you from having the boo hag. No one wanted a boo hag to come into the home. And so as this bottle tree hung into the yard, it took on evil spirits. As it took on evil spirits into the bottles in the summer and in the morning sun, that dew would then dry up in the bottle. And then the family felt like the, those evil spirits that could have came into the home did not go into the home. They got caught into the bottles. And as the sun came in, it dried the bottles. Uh, the reason why they, the, the Gullah people thought it was an evil spirit is because when the wind blows across the bottle, it makes a whoo sound and that they feel it to be more of a evil ghost. They felt also that the boo hag was something that happened very often. That's a time of a, uh, scientifically it's called sleep apnea. And so when you go into sleep on your back and your body gets into a still stage, you want to move, you cannot move. But then, so they felt that that was a time of a, a boo hag or evil spirit was riding the body and pulling the, pulling the, pulling the, 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 making the body weak. And so by having blue hags, I'm sorry, by having the blue, paint blue porches or the paint blue uh, trimming around the, uh, the shutters, painting around the door frame, kept the blue, kept the boo hag out. Boo hag does not cross over water. And so it was a, it was a, using the color blue as a way of protecting us. And so that speaks on those three pictures on misconceptions and, and things that people may misunderstand. And please ask questions if one of these pictures you do not understand, uh, as we still have a little bit of time without losing. But Ms. Lois, let's go to the next slide. Karina, can we have the next slide? Yes, I'm trying. Um, I'm not, it's not coming up for me. So I'm having a little bit of an issue here. If you can just uh, keep going for a second, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I will see if I can come
come back for you. Sounds good. Sounds good. Any questions, Ms. Lois? Well, Corey, when you, um, you say you make baskets 12, 13, 14 hours a day, do you man your mm -hmm. own um, booth or, or do you have somebody who helps you out? Yes, I do. The, I, I run the booth. And so well, once again, as I, as I became a member through my, my wife's family, my, um, my in-laws, they had a business in the city market since the 60s. And so Karen's grandmother ran the business. Karen's mom ran the business. Mm -hmm. So that business has been running in the Charleston city market uh, since, you know, way before I was even born. As I came into the family um, in, the late, in the late 90s, um, I then pretty much inherited the family business. Um, I now represent five to six different artists on the table. So if you did come to my booth in the market, I'm not, it's not only Corey's work, it's actually the work of the whole family. And that motto has been done uh, way before I even became a market vendor. Mm -hmm. um, so whoever would run the market business would then also take family members' baskets as well. And so um, as I now run the family's business, I represent whoever are artisans close to the bloodline, close to Karen's mom, or uh, sometimes a, a cousin may have a few pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, her sister, Carlene and I, Carlene ran the business before I came out. And so I may now, I now, um, Carlene hasn't came back since COVID, but she's still a major part of the, uh, who I am. I learned a ton from Carlene because there's different shapes and designs that I learned from her. I learned the basics from Karen, but then a lot of new shapes and designs or how to do this or how to do that. I, uh, I definitely credit my sister-in-law. We call each other brother and sister. And so if you met us in the booth, you're not gonna know we're in-laws unless you just really know Corey very well because we get along so well. We get along so well that he's my sister, you know? Um, <laughs> Um, so are sales of the baskets, not just your own, but other people's, are they holding up well? Um, are people buying online if they can't travel to you? Well, as far as, um, I'm going to speak as a whole. I'm going to speak as a whole. Um, it's a blessing. It's a blessing that we're not all over the world. Um, if you want a gullah basket, you only can get it from the coast of Carolina only. And that's a blessing. That helps us. To, to want to keep it alive that helps us to want to keep do, you know doing it as far as personal sales I've been blessed to use social media I use social media platforms to reach out to my fans um, and then with that being said I, I do snapshots of my booth and I have I think on Facebook if you want to see what's available inbox me and I'll forward you what's available and I offer free shipping so I'm able to sell through the whole year of COVID uh, the whole time of COVID, the major part, 2020 of COVID, I was able to do online sales based off of using what we have today. So I've been using Venmo, Zelle, Cash App, you know, PayPal, and I'm shipping. I'm shipping these bread baskets, these fruit bowls, you know, whoever orders a piece, if it's, if it's very elaborate, he or she realizes, or they will realize that there's a line of people that I have to weave for. So they don't get it just like that. If they want it to be a trash can or they want it to be a waste basket or something big as a, a, a recliner chair, I'll make it. It's just, it's gonna take me some time. And so um, there's a list of families that are waiting on different pieces. This one here in my lap that I've been working on, I have, they ordered a set of two. Um, they want twin baskets. That's gonna be almost impossible because they're hand woven. But I'm gonna try to make them as close as I can in, in visual, in visual. So when you see them, they're gonna look very similar. But these are large pieces. So for instance, this client, they said, Corey, we want a 28 long. And if you can see yeah. what I got going on here. So I got 28 long. They want 14 wide. So that's gonna be the width from here to here. They want it 14 tall. So wow. this is gonna be a piece that's gonna take. Um, I can get one of these done in about two months. Yeah. Um, and they ordered two of them. So I'm going to be with this client for four and a half months. Um, and, and I, I stay on the piece until the piece is done. And so no, that's Corey, a lot of questions. Tell us about what's hanging off the bottom of your basket. Are those the, the ends? So that's, so that's the, uh, that's the palmetto 
fingers, strands, feelers, or what have you. Yeah. I go through a cleaning process. Once I'm done weaving the basket, I go clip all this off. Um, I'm more of a neat freak. That's what my wife calls me. I'm a little, little uh, uh, what's those initials? Um, uh, OCD. Uh, OCD, yeah. <laughs> I, ha I have sweetgrass OCD. And so, and so this here is a process that I go through. I'm the only artist. I've never seen no one else do it. Um, but I take a very fine pair of scissors, a real small tip, and I go back and clip all this off and I leave no loose strands, no loose hairs. That just drives me nuts. If you can see me, I don't do too much hairs or strands. <laughs> and so I don't want that on my baskets as, as well, Ms. Lois. Yes. So we've had a request to, uh -huh. for you to show us um, the, the stitch as close up as you can. Okay. I don't know how close you can get to your phone. Let's see. Let's, let's see what I can do. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So it's a coiled weaving. And yep. so coiled weaving, nail bone, coiled weaving, sticking it in the material like that. And then what we do, we take that tool out. It holds open for a few seconds. Okay. And so as it holds open for a few seconds, then we're able to thread it. Um, okay. And so that... That happens a million plus times to get a piece complete. Um, this tool is what gives shapes and designs based on where I stick it will make the basket do different, different movement. Right. Now, the way that the movement stays finalized, stays hard, stays not able to move or bend out of that shape is because row upon row, once again, we take the next row and the next row and the next row and it then it, it 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 makes the piece solid so that it does not move around. And so um, that it is truly a coiled weaving because with it being known as coiled, one row locks in the top row. Yes. But you also you're pulling that pretty tight, I would imagine. Yeah, extremely, I have extremely strong hands. Um, so if you look at my my inventory or, or or my my work over the years, I don't make many small pieces. Nothing smaller than my hand because my hands are big. And so having big hands is it's easier to get a bigger piece done. Um, uh -huh. My wife, for instance, Karen, she's a, a, a master weaver in small, petite little stitching of jewelry, earrings. Uh, she can make a Christmas ornament. She makes a real small little stitching. Um, that's probably more tedious than big baskets. Yeah. Um, and so every weaver, every weaver has a skill set that he or she is great at. And what makes it so cool, we as artisans, we don't try to, you know, step on the next person's technique. You know, if that person is known for making crosses, um, there's a weaver, Miss Lynette. Lynette is awesome at making a spiral uh, right. uh, a, a cross. She's awesome. And so I get people to email me or call me, Corey, can you make me one of those crosses? I would say no, very quickly, no. I don't make the crosses, but I'll send you to the artist that will make the cross for you. Um, or a person that, um, uh, one of the senior weavers, uh, she made a, uh, a, a uh, uh, what you call it, you put babies in. Um, shit. Uh, <laughs> baby uh, bassinet. Baby cradle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have the or bassinet. Right, yes. so she made that style basket and no one has ever touched trying to do that again, yeah. you know? And so just out of respect, the Gullah culture is such a culture of respecting each other. We don't step on toes. We don't downplay the next artisan. Um, if we don't have nothing nice to say about them, we just won't say nothing. And that's one of the great things about the art because it's a lot of us within our small little community of Mount Pleasant, you know? And so as, as everyone respects everyone, we're able to thrive that way, yes. That we could use it more of that, Corey. We do have a question about your stitching. When you okay. um, when you are stitching in, do you stitch into the bundle below or do you stitch under it? So when okay, you're so when you're attaching, are you just sort of capturing half or or some of the elements in the bunch below, or are you doing the whole thing? Okay, so I'm glad you're wording it that way, Miss Lois, because I still want a little bit of confusion here, okay? We, okay. We're, we're, still, we're still keeping some secrets 
a little mystery. You know I mean? huh? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Gullabaskers, we, we, don't, we don't want everyone, and this is a group of weavers here in this Zoom, you pretty much can pretty much figure it out because All you're right. artisans yourself. But we do, have, we do have a way of secrecy that we want to stay close to us out, out, of, out, of, um, out of heritage and out of culture. But to answer your question, we're sticking the palm metal in the row below it. Um, and, and that's just, okay. that's just what I said, fair enough. And so it's not that I'm avoiding the question, but I am avoiding the question, if that makes any sense. All right, we'll let you do that. And it just means we'll have to buy one of your baskets. And, 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 and that, um, I won't pull it apart, but I'll sure look at it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are not going to be able to get any more slides. Um, okay. That's so um, I, this has just been, the questions have been great. Um, and Corey, you are, you're just so much fun to talk to and to watch you weave. I've enjoyed this tremendously. I appreciate y'all having, having me. Yeah, well, yeah. it. Well, I think we're gonna have to have you come back, okay? Can we have Corey no, no part problem. two sometime? No problem, no problem. matter of fact, fun. I think it'd be kind of cool seeing the closest to the finished product project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and I, I also do. want to, um, tell people that you really do post wonderful things on social media. And uh, I always enjoy putting those things there. Karina, did you want to say anything or do you want me to wrap this up? She's muted. So I will thank you all for, uh, for coming. And um, we are almost done with the show that is all of our fiber uh, stories. We'll be putting up a new show on September 10th, I think it is, about cups of good, all kinds of vessels and things that uh, uh, you can enjoy looking at and purchase. So I invite you to keep track of that. Check our website. All yeah. of our programs are recorded and are available. So you can email all your friends in right away and say, you got to go watch Corey Alston do his stuff. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everyone that we are a nonprofit. And if we are going to keep doing stuff like this, we need your help. So thank you very much. And good night. Good night, Corey. Good night, Ms. Thank Lois. It's, 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 thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Bye -bye. Good night. Awesome interview. Good night. Good night thank time. you.